Test 3. Listening. You will hear a number of different recordings and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. At the end of the test, you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to section 1. Section 1. You will hear a telephone conversation between an operator and a caller. The caller is inquiring about car insurance. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 4. You will see that there is an example that has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played first. Good afternoon, Heartline Car Insurance. How can I help you? Hello, I'd like to speak to someone about car insurance. Certainly, sir. Can I take your name, please? It's Liam. Liam Bird. OK, Mr Bird. Is the policy for you? Yes, I bought the car last night. It's still with the original owner, though, until I get the insurance sorted out. Will I be able to do this over the phone now? Of course, sir. If you have all the information we need to process the application, we should be able to sort it out for you immediately. Could you tell me the make and model, Mr Bird? Yes, it's a Ford Fiesta. The caller's car is a Ford Fiesta, so Ford Fiesta has been written in the space. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 4. Good afternoon, Heartline Car Insurance. How can I help you? Hello, I'd like to speak to someone about car insurance. Certainly, sir. Can I take your name, please? It's Liam. Liam Bird. OK, Mr Bird. Is the policy for you? Yes, I bought the car last night. It's still with the original owner, though, until I get the insurance sorted out. Will I be able to do this over the phone now? Of course, sir. If you have all the information we need to process the application, we should be able to sort it out for you immediately. Could you tell me the make and model, Mr Bird? Yes, it's a Ford Fiesta. And can I have the registration number, please? Yes, it's 3R1JTW. OK. I can see it's a 2002 model, is that right? That's right, yes. And what's the current mileage, Mr Bird? Very high, unfortunately. 90,000 miles. OK. It's obviously very reliable. <laughs> Hopefully, yes. And how many miles will you be driving per year? Um, probably about 6,000 a year. OK. And where will the car be kept overnight? Well, I don't have a garage or a driveway, so it'll be on the road. OK, nearly there. When would you like the policy to be effective from? Immediately, I suppose. Yes, I'm hoping to drive the car home this evening. So could I be covered from today? Yes, that's fine. Now, do you want fully comprehensive cover or third-party fire and theft? Just third-party fire and theft. It's only an old car. And how much no-claims bonus have you got, sir? Six years. Before you hear more of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10.
Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. OK. Have you decided to take up any of our additional cover options? We have legal cover for a small fee each month. And we can offer a very competitive rate for driver injury insurance. Or we could... No, no thanks. Sorry, but I've already looked through what's available on your website and how much it all costs. I've got breakdown cover with another company, and the car comes with a spare set of keys, so I should be OK there. I'd like to take out the 14-day courtesy car, though, and keep my no-claims bonus. So, I'll protect that, and I'd like to have the windscreen cover as well. OK, Mr Bird. So that's third-party fire and theft, with additional cover for a courtesy car, protected no-claims bonus, and windscreen cover. That comes to £425. We'll need to see proof of your no-claims bonus. Can you send this to us? Yes, no problem at all. OK. I just need your payment details and I can process this for you. So, can I have your full name, please? It's Liam Bird. That's B-Y-R-D. And your address? 35 Botteville Crescent, Birmingham, B561ED. And your date of birth? The 11th of November, 1969. And your telephone number, Mr Bird? 0121 677 9887. How will you be paying, Mr Bird? By credit card? Uh, by debit card, if that's OK. Yes, that's fine. What kind of card is it? It's a Visa card. OK. Can you give me the full number that runs across the centre of the card? Yes, it's 2337 4006 2005 1551. And the three digit security number on the reverse of the card? OK, hang on. Yes, it's 426. Thank you. Finally, can I just ask you how you got to hear about our company? Yes, sure. I found you on the internet. Thanks. OK, your payment has been processed successfully. You're now covered, Mr Bird. Would you like us to send your documents to you, or are you happy to download them from the website? Would you mind posting them to me, please? I'd like a paper copy and my printer's not working. No problem, Mr Bird. That is the end of Section 1. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 2. Section 2. You will hear a presenter interviewing a student on a radio show. The student is talking about her experiences of mountain climbing. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Now listen and answer questions 11 to 14. Welcome back to BURS, your independent student union radio station. We're looking at some of the incredible feats one or two of you have been up to during your summer break. I'm with Catherine, who's going to tell us about her successful climb of one of the most iconic mountains in the world, Mont Blanc. Catherine, tell us a little about your achievement. Well, actually, it was the second time I've reached the summit. The first was in 2007, the year before I came to university. People are often surprised to hear how popular the mountain is with climbers. I've read somewhere over 30,000 people attempt the climb each year, and around 200 people a day summit during the summer season, so it's very crowded up there. Unfortunately, it's also potentially very dangerous. In July 2007, 
the months before I did my first climb, the death toll reached 30, mainly due to bad weather conditions. The sheer number of people can cause falling rocks, which only adds to the danger. Before you hear more of the interview, you have some time to look at questions 15 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 15 to 20. So why did you do the same climb twice? And was it easier the second time around? <laughs> In many ways, they were totally different experiences. The first time I went as part of an organised group, there were about 20 of us and we took four days to summit. It was much more of a sociable experience compared to the second climb. This year, I decided to go solo with just one overnight stop. I felt more confident having already summited once, and I wanted to face the challenge of being in control. Actually, you're never really alone. There are other climbers and groups around all the time, but I suppose being alone made me feel more intrepid. The first climb was quite difficult, as the weather was very changeable, and we found ourselves climbing in very cold, windy conditions. We were in a group, so we offered each other encouragement, but it was still very difficult. The weather this time was wonderful. Plus, I also spent a few days beforehand in Chamonix and acclimatised myself more to the altitude. This certainly made it easier. You can achieve the same thing by climbing some of the smaller peaks in the area first, but I wanted a more leisurely start. It was fantastic. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Did your experiences on the first climb help you the second time around? I'm wondering if you have any useful advice for others planning on doing something similar. Well, because the climb's becoming so popular, I think people don't always give it the respect it deserves. And I'm not talking here about the physical condition you need to be in to take on a challenge like this, or having the right equipment. That goes without saying. I think what took me by surprise more than anything else was the extreme weather conditions, even in the summer. For those who want to summit in a single day or two, the climb will often start early in the morning, so you'll need to make sure you're wearing enough layers to protect yourself from the cold and wind. You'll be glad of this when you hit queues and find yourself standing around, waiting to move on. Then at the other extreme, around midday, you must make sure you're fully protected from the sun, or you're likely to get very badly burnt. Whether you climb alone, in a group, or with a guide, that will depend on your own experience. But however you decide to go, it's essential that you take your time and get used to the altitude. OK, many thanks for taking the time to come in and tell us all about it. That is the end of Section 2. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 3. Section 3. You will hear two students talking about revising for exams. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 23. Now listen and answer questions 21 to 23. Elaine, have you seen the exam timetable? They've just put it up on the department notice board. Yeah, I've just come from there. 
I must be honest, I'd put the thought of exams to the back of my mind. Now the dates are there, it all seems a little scary. Have you been revising much? No, not really. We've got a month, so I'm going to really get going on it now. Why don't we try and work together? Yes, let's meet a few times a week. I don't like working on my own. I never seem to be able to focus properly. What about Tuesday and Thursday? Oh, no, I have a late seminar on Tuesday. Monday and Thursday? What about that? Yes, that'll be okay. How do you go about revising? Have you got any tips? Well, our tutor said we shouldn't start background reading or writing notes until we're clear in our mind what we need to revise. He said start with a revision timetable so we know what to revise and when. That sounds sensible. Then we can use the timetable to work independently. It'll help us to make sure we're both working on the same subjects. We can make that the first thing to do in our first session, write up a timetable. OK. I reckon the kinds of things we can do on our own in between meetings are things like arranging our materials, lecture and seminar notes, handouts, feedback from our tutors, that kind of thing. If we arrange all these by subject, according to the timetable, it'll help us get organised. Before you hear more of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 24 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 24 to 30. Good idea. Once we have all the content, I suppose we could make notes based on past exam papers. We had a talk about note-taking in one of the seminars. They reckon you shouldn't copy word for word. It helps to learn things if you paraphrase main points. And don't just copy loads of facts either. Try to get a feel for the main arguments or theories and match any facts to these. I also like using mind maps or spidergrams when I make notes. It means you can put down a lot of information, but so that it's nicely organised. It also means you can add new notes after. And bullet points. They really help you focus on main points rather than trying to link them together in sentences. We also need to remember to make a note of where the information comes from. The author, publisher, that kind of thing. That's really important. Otherwise, when you're writing the assignment, you can never remember where you got a particular quote from. I know I said earlier about testing each other when we get together, but now I think about it. Do you think it would be a better idea to talk through our notes on a particular subject, have a kind of discussion between ourselves? We could use the questions in the past papers to base the discussion on. Yes, so basically the timetable can be a discussion schedule. Then after each session, we could go away and do a timed essay on the subject. Maybe swap and mark each other's essays. That's a good way to learn, I think. Critique each other's work. Great idea. So we'll start next Monday with a timetable. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 4. Section 4. You are going to hear a student giving a talk about her research project on the subject of urban design. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 37.
Now listen and answer questions 31 to 37. OK, everyone. This week it's the turn of Carol to talk about the progress of her research project. Over to you, Carol. Thanks. Yes, hello, everybody. I'm going to talk about something called shared space and the research I'm in the process of carrying out into people's attitudes to this, as it might affect them in their local community. First, I'd best explain what shared space is. In essence, shared space is an approach to urban design that attempts to open up Main Street junctions more to pedestrians by reducing the dominance of motor vehicles. It's a form of planning associated with a Dutch road traffic engineer called Hans Munderman, who believed that by sharing the space available, drivers become more aware of pedestrians and drive more carefully. Pedestrians are able to move more freely in this shared space, and the number of accidents is reduced. Shared space design is usually employed in urban centers where pedestrians congregate, such as in shopping areas. It usually results in demarcations between vehicle traffic and pedestrians being reduced or removed altogether. This includes features like curbs, road surface markings, and traffic signs. There are many examples of shared space in operation abroad and in the UK, for example, in Kensington High Street in London and Giles Circus in Ipswich. In addition to a decline in accidents, those in favor of shared space also claim additional benefits such as a reduction in unsightly street furniture, like signs and metal guardrails, which can be replaced with more trees, planters, seating areas, and other aesthetic improvements determined by local people. With these urban centers easier to get around in, supporters claim that people are more inclined to shop there, and as a consequence, the center can become a more thriving area for local people and businesses. Here are some before and after photographs of shared space developments to give you an idea of what it looks like. Despite all its advantages, Shared space is opposed by various interest groups. Some motorist organizations claim that the system means drivers lose important information through the reduction of signage. Those representing blind people argue that removing features such as curbs, railings, and barriers between pavements and roads takes away familiar support and means this group of people cannot negotiate their way as easily as other road users. Cyclist representatives have also criticized some aspects of the scheme, arguing that, despite benefits, some cyclists feel more bullied by motorists and consequently less safe. Supporters of shared space themselves also point out that a lack of experience and understanding of shared space by planners can lead to negative experiences for all these groups. Before you hear more of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 38 to 40. Now listen and answer questions 38 to 40. To carry out my research, I approached a local campaigning group in my area who were interested in adopting shared space in our local shopping center. I discovered that they were very keen to get feedback from local residents on shared space, and because of the experience I'd gained in research methods, they were keen for me to construct a questionnaire for them. The focus group have a website and an active social media presence, and they decided that the questionnaire will be available as an online survey. Hard copy questionnaires will also be used for face-to-face -face interviews. There are plans to leave paper questionnaires in the local library, but this is still under discussion. Interviews using the questionnaires will be carried out with pedestrians in the area itself. The group don't have the resources to deliver additional questionnaires to the homes of local residents, 
so this option was dropped. We have met on several occasions to agree on the data the focus group need. I've pointed out that if they want valid results, the questions must be totally unbiased and not in any way loaded to encourage participants to give the preferred answer. Also, we mustn't assume that participants have sufficient information to answer these questions. We're currently looking into how we can best present the concept of shared space during interviews. I've designed some of the questionnaire, and I'd just like to spend a few minutes going through it with you. I'd be grateful for any feedback you have. That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.